Welcome to the Wild Tales podcast. I'm Jason Fox, and this series is all about adventure, resilience, and inspirational humans. The podcast is presented by the Book of Man and in partnership with Talisker, the single malt whiskey made by the sea. My guest today is Martine Wright, MBE, a British sitting volleyball player, presenter, and one of the most inspirational people in the country. Martine lost both her legs in an explosion during the 7-7 London bombings, but has since established herself as not just a popular athlete, but a campaigner for better compensation for victims of bombings and is an ambassador for disabled sport. In the episode, we answer some questions that you've asked me on Instagram. I'm going to be sending a bottle of Talisker to the top question. Anyway, here we go, and I hope you enjoy it. Martine, here you are. You've eventually, we've got you on, which is great news. You're, you're an absolute legend, and you've been through an awful lot and achieved an awful lot. But um, before we start, I'd like to know how lockdown's been for you, because obviously we're still in the sort of the, the tail end of it at the moment. And, you know, it's been, it's, domina- it's dominated lots of people's lives, everyone's lives, really. So how's it been? Yeah, everyone, everyone. I mean, you know, it's it's hilarious, isn't it? That Not hilarious, but it's like four months ago, we'd never heard of things like COVID-19 or, or furloughing or social distancing. Um and yeah, like many people, it's it's. I mean, there's been parts of it that that we've really enjoyed as a as a family. You know, being able to spend more time with your immediate family. Um, you know, we've got quite hectic schedules, so just simple things to be able to sit down and um, have a meal together and spend more more time together. Really, um, so that's been good. Um, but like many people, it's been. Been been up, been up and down. It's it's you have good days, don't you? And then you have bad days. Yeah. Um, in homeschooling as well. I'm sure there's lots of parents mm. out there Woo-hoo! that have been doing that. That's been interesting with my ten year old. Um. Have you, how many kids have you got? Uh, we've just got Oscar. Oscar. Oh, okay. Um. We have Daisy the dog, who you can't really see at the moment. Black no. Labrador. So um. Yeah. So my son is is he says he's. He's like my husband on the outside, but he's like me on the inside, which I think is very sweet. But as a result of that, he tends to be quite stubborn. He tends to <laughs> he tends to have something in his brain and go for it, um, which isn't a bad thing. But uh, that's a good yeah, thing. So <laughs> lockdown has been interesting. It's been a roller coaster of emotions, but you know, I've I've really quite enjoyed it. I've mm. I've, I've not enjoyed not seeing extended family. I have elderly parents like many people out there that's been um but i've actually got fitter my my fitness regime is is, has increased but um yeah it's been ups and downs isn't it i mean it's been such a shocker well um so what are the things that like i've i've focused a lot on i started doing a lot of running but that sort of died off a little bit and i've I've now moved into different things physical wise because I've got different stuff coming up. Yeah. I've, fo- I've focused a lot at home. So, what, what are the key things that you've sort of focused on in this time? Yeah, I mean, um, fitness actually has been, you know, I, I, I still am a Paralympian. I'm still very much part of the Great Britain City volleyball team, um, women's team. But what I found is actually by being locked down, not being able to get to the gym. Mm. I've tended to be more creative with with my workout. So actually, trying online classes that I've 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 never tried free online classes, whether that's been beginnings in yoga or um, I've done quite a few Pilates classes. But what I have been doing three times a week, even four times a week, is um, a twenty minute hit class, which I really really enjoy. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes with the lovely Joe Wicks, which actually. Yeah obviously those mornings where you're not feeling great um so I've, I've focused on that obviously again focusing on family whether that's yeah. immediate family or your extended family supporting those and actually I'm looking out out my road now I'm, I'm, I'm obviously at home and the whole community sense you know um I've been trying to help in in the community, whether that's going up to get prescriptions yeah. or whether it is delivering. Um, I'm a I'm a keen cook, so um, I've been having a laugh and doing meals on wheels, on wheelchair. <laughs> so, um, 
doing that to a couple of neighbours. Um, but yeah, just it's a it's a bit like a reset button, isn't it? I mean, mm-hmm. I don't. It's it's you can look at it two ways. You can look at it as you know this epidemic. You know, it's it's completely taken over our world and you know completely influenced how we live our life and our personal relationships and every and our you know our mental well being is is just you know that's bit really been affected. But I think you can look at it as in a bit of a reset button and appreciating what you have, appreciating sometimes the simple things in life. Yeah. Um, and really, I think evaluating what is what is important and what's not. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I agree totally. Yeah. It's sort of, yes, it's been difficult for some, but again, it's made, it's made almost everyone do exactly what you spoke about there and focus on the things that they don't normally have time for or don't right. think they've got time for. And I think, you know, when it's sort of, when it when it becomes a, a sort of thing of the past, you know, a, a memory. I think a lot of people are going to miss the opportunity that it's presented itself to. You know, as in, you know, it's almost like because you can't control it, it's forced upon you to do things at home or focus on the people that you don't normally focus on. And I think when that gets taken away again because of busy busy schedules and that, oh, you, know, I, yeah. you know, I'll miss that period a little bit. Not for the not for the bad stuff, obviously, but. You know, there's there is good things. There's always good yeah. things in whatever situation we get thrown into. But um, <clears throat> Martin, you've you've achieved an awful lot since uh, those horrific bombings back in 2005. Can you do you mind telling us a little bit about what happened and you know the process that you went? What, what happened then? The process after? How you sort of adjusted your mindset to deal with that? Do you know what I mean? Is that yeah. is that all right? Yeah, no, of course it is. Um, so obviously it's been the 15th anniversary. Uh, yeah. I can't quite believe it has been 15 years, although in a way it does feel like 15 years because I feel like I've always been who I am now. Um, yeah. You know, I obviously, you know, it, it happened to me at the age of 33, so I, I, I was whoever I was for 33 years, but... For the last 15 years, I am who I am today. So mm. it's like it has been ages away, but not because the memories and the feelings and the, you know, everything, the smells, the, the sounds mm. um, are still very vivid from from that day. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it was the 6th of July that I remember because I was celebrating at work being a Londoner, being a Bow Bell Cockney that I'm very, very proud of, I was celebrating mm-hmm. London had won the Olympic and Paralympic bid. Um, and that was a whole reason why I was late that morning on the 7th of July, the day the bombings happened. Um, and because obviously I'd, I'd been out celebrating the night before. Um, Obviously. Yeah. Like, like loads of us were, you know. And it's it's funny, said, actually. Just I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I remember... That I met because I was on a I was on a, a a career course at the time, and I remember the London Olympics being awarded, and I was like, "Wow, that's awesome!" Yeah. And literally within the space of a day, I know it was it was like, "Cry, are we? Is it going to get to you know what's happening with all this? This is just chaotic." But anyway, <laughs> uh, apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone does remember those two days, you know, um, you know, and. Uh, that's why for me my my whole journey is surrounded by those two days and that's why you know I will always believe that I couldn't have stopped what happened that day and for me to be involved and how very very lucky I was but uh yeah it was it was it was a normal morning um slightly late and you know got on that 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 train um got on the first train and it was delayed and then they ended up getting jumping on the circle line and I remember running up the escalator, um, always one of those people that can't stand still on an escalator. I always had to run up. <laughs> and then I remember getting to the Circle Line platform um, and I remember thinking, what a result, the, the tube is coming in. And I remember jumping on it and I remember reading my paper. And again, you couldn't turn that paper without reading something on the Olympics and Paralympics. Mm. And I distinct, you know, I remember those feelings that morning. I remember reading it and going, wow, 
I need mm. to get to this. This is going to be massive. I need to get tickets to this. And literally yeah. seconds later, the explosion happened. Mm. Um, and obviously I didn't I didn't uh, get tickets. I, I took part, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and that's why I think I was always always made to make, make that journey. But, um, yeah, the, the memories of that morning will always, always, always stay with me, as I said, the smells and the screams and... Mm. My guardian angel, Liz, Liz Kenworthy, who um, gave me tourniquets to stop my bleeding, although I lost 80% of my blood, and she stayed with me for an hour and a quarter. Mm. I was alive to be um, to be cut out, basically, because all the metal was mangled on me. Um, and, yeah, and I all I remember is waking up. I remember everything, everything of, of that day, and I was conscious pretty much all the way through it. Yeah. But I, I remember waking up eight days later from a coma that I was in. Had no idea that my mum and dad and my family didn't know where I was for two days and they were searching the whole of London and they finally found me at the Royal London Hospital, but I had no idea what I'd been through. And they told me that, you know, I'd had both my legs amputated. Mm. And to be fair, Foxy, at that point, I just thought, it's over. My life. Is over. I, you know, I was girl about town. I was career girl. I was this. I was that. What what I thought was important, you know, um, and I just wasn't me. And I I, I just kept looking down, down in this bed and saying, I've got no legs. I've got no legs. And it wasn't until probably a few weeks after. Well, it's probably about six weeks after. And I was strong enough uh, to go to the gym physio for the first time. And this was a big, big day for me. I mean, number one, I'd met other victims from, from that day. And I realised that actually I might have been more physically injured than me, but psychologically they were they were really traumatised. They were, they were, you know, um, a lot of them affected, you know, worse than me on the, yeah. on the psychological side. Uh, but that was the day that I found out how many people died that day. And, and I had no idea before that point I had no idea that 52 people died. And it was when I realised that and when I realised how lucky I was and realised that even though I was just four foot away from him, I was one of the closest people to him, um, I was a lucky one and I survived. And as a result of that, I just thought, you know, I've got to take strength from the 52 people and carry on, carry on my life, you know. Um, and I did, and and I spent nearly a year, well, 366 days in hospital. Wow. Uh, yeah, learned to walk. Not the easiest thing in the world. Um, was, it, was all the support that came your way, was that through the NHS, or was there oh, other outside? I'm telling you now, I would not be here. I've been shouting about this for years and years, but thankfully... We finally have the appreciation for our NHS. Yeah, that's great. Because I am a huge product of them. I would mm. not, you know, it makes me feel teary what mm. they have given me. And, of course, it's on a medical level. Of course, it's on a, on a we've got to amputate Martin, Martin's legs. We've got to revive her several times. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. But, actually, it's the psychological side. Yeah. It's the psychological side. And again, it's not just about the patient. Those guys have the most pressured jobs in, in the world. You know, they're all pretty much on rubbish pay. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, they do because they love their job. But it's not just the patient that they're supporting. It's all their family as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, the support that my family needed when they 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 searching for me, you know, and thrown into this world that they never thought in their worst nightmares that they would see their baby daughter in, you know. Um, so, again, that's a good thing out of all this lockdown is, thankfully, we are all appreciating what the NHS do for us. And, yes, the level of care is is absolutely fantastic. And, actually, the lady that taught me to walk is called Maggie. And recently she met the love of her life. Her, 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 I have to say this because she's taught people to walk for about 25 years. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Um, her surname was Uden, and she's just married the love of her life, whose name's Mr. Walker. 
So now she teaches people <laughs> to walk, and her name is Mrs. Walker. I love that's, that. very, um, that's very apt. Do you think she? Do you think she did that deliberately? She went <laughs> went looking for someone <laughs> called Walker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I, I say that because she's one of my best friends now. Yeah, and not of just physio. And I, and I remember when I got married to Nick, and she said to me, "You know, Martine, I want to get you a really special present." I went, Maggie, you are having a laugh. You got me the mm. best in the world. And that was the gift of walking. So I definitely want that, you know. Um, so, yeah, so so that was all the care of the NHS. Spent 366 days in hospital. And then I came home. And like maybe many of your listeners, that's a hard time. That's a proper hard time because... You've been in this environment where it's completely normal to have legs and arms missing. People around me that that, that have been through similar things to me. And now I was going back to normal life, but not not normal as I knew it. So, I, you know, not living in my own flat, having to move in, in with my mom. And that's a tough time, a real tough time. And I found it tough because I found... I couldn't get away from the memories. I couldn't get away from the memories of who I once was. And you know, what my life was about. I couldn't get away from that in the beginning. So I thought, right, I, you know, I've got to go off and I've got to create new memories and I've got to find out who who Martine is again. Yeah. And, that, you know, I did. That's when I grabbed every opportunity I could, um, which I still do now, which I think my husband's son says below. <laughs> um, but... You know, and whether that was from flying planes, you know, flying planes completely on my own to jumping out of planes. I'm sure you've done a lot of this. <laughs> um, you know, you're happy. Um, um, awesome. and, you know, all things like that, you know, being awarded the Helen Rollison Award, you know, at sport. I mean, that was a huge, huge honour. And yeah, being amazing. awarded an MBE from the Queen. I mean, mm. you know, that's just surreal. It's, you said to me, 15 years ago, Martin, you're going to be, you know, captain of the Great Britain City Volleyball. You're going to get an MBE from the quick. I would have thought you were off your rocker. You know, yeah. Really off your rocker. I would have gone, Foxy, what are you talking about? Yeah, you know, a, lot, um, a lot of people say that to me anyway. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I get that sometimes as well. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so I knew I had to go off and grab those opportunities and do you know what it's taught me it has taught me that we are all going to go through something in life I'm not saying that people are going to go through a bombing or anything like that although again you know how terrorism affects all of our lives now you know um but you know I truly believe that if you have the support and you have the choice, those choices, you realise you have the choices and you go out and you you accept the change that's happened. You can go out and get amazing things from it. You can go out and, you know, achieve things that you never, ever thought, you know. I mean, personally, I could I could achieve. I'm, I'm a professional sportswoman. I was an international marketing manager, you know. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, it's just it's just, it's it's just it's just a journey. The journey changed for me. And if you said to me now, I've got a time machine. Do you want to get in it and go back to the sixth of July, two thousand and five? I'd say no, Foxy. I'd say no. I'd say I love my life. I love the people I meet every day through the jobs I do and the volunteer work I do. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn back the page. I have a beautiful son and a lovely husband, and life that's is a, good. That's a great mindset to have, Martine. Um, I just quickly going back, you know, because you said you were awake for it. You know, you were you were conscious, yeah. and then you said, was it was it an induced coma that you were put into? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. So I lost, well, I lost both my legs above the knee. Yeah. I lost 80% of my blood, which I still can't understand how. No, I, 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 I can't get me around that sort of thing. I've, no, got, I've, I've, was, heard, I've, I've heard of it happen to a few friends before, and I'm like, how does that work? Yeah. Like, and, and for an hour and a, hour and a half, I was, I was down there again. I mean, if Liz hadn't given me these two tourniquets to put around yeah. my, my legs, I would not have 
you are, I wouldn't be talking to you now. Um, but was 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 Liz someone that was on that carriage with you? Yeah, no. So she wasn't on the carriage that we were on, but she was off. Uh, did she had a day off, or I think she was going to a conference? And she is a policewoman, and right. she um, she's not now now retired, but um, mm. she was a few. Uh, well, a few carriages behind, and the bomb happened, and any any person like myself, I thought we were in a crash. I thought, oh, my God, we've crashed. Yeah. She immediately knew. She immediately knew. And she was an example of one of those people. I mean, she's a policewoman, but there were so many people that day that didn't run away from danger. They, and it was, it's not their jobs. I mean, mm. obviously... We've got all the emergency services again. I wouldn't be here without them. Yeah. Uh, and I've met them, the firemen that, you know, helped me. And the, But I just think, um, I just think that, you know, there were so many people that day, and we've seen from recent attacks, you know, mm. that were trying to help other people and it didn't didn't matter whether they were risking their own lives they they had that urge to go off and help other people and i i just think that's why it you know terrorism is is you know one of those days where you look at it and you go oh that's the most selfish act in the world and the other end of the scale you will always see those people that are doing the selfless acts that are running towards danger that are wrapping tourniquets around people's legs that are carrying them, you know. Um, the worst situations do bring out the best in other people, though, which is a, which is a, the silver lining to be taken from some of these things. Completely. And I think, you know, we can, we can draw strengths through going through something like that or going, you know, anyone going through something traumatic in their life. You can. I truly believe that you can look at it in a different way. And I'm not saying it happens overnight. I, I didn't suddenly have this turning point and then the next day everything was great. No. no. It's about the ups and downs. And to be honest, you know, I can say, oh, yeah, I woke up that day and everything changed. But it takes a long time. The healing process takes a long time and yeah. you can't rush it. And any change you go through, you cannot miss those processes. You cannot miss... The ups and downs, because it helps you physically, but it helps you here. It helps you deal with it. And, you know, if I didn't have those feelings when I was in hospital saying either, I can't, I can't take anymore, I can't walk anymore, I can't take another step, or, or whether it was if I was brave enough that morning to look in the mirror and look at myself, my body image, you know, was I brave enough to do that? Mm. And by just going through those things, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of psychologically that it's terrible going through those days, but after those horrible days, you have good days. And, and I liken it to what people are going through now. Mm. And sometimes is, the unpredictability of it, you know. It, it is a journey, isn't it? It's a journey that you go on and, you know, every, every journey, if you think break, break it down to anything that anyone's ever done, every journey has its ups and downs, there's hills and there's dips and troughs. And yeah. It's all part of that journey of becoming a, a more rounded person. But I'd like, you know, talking about the rehabilitation, how, what, what did that look like? You know, what, you know, how is it structured? Obviously, you know, one, one day you're walking around fine. The next time, you know, a few weeks later, you're, you're sat in bed. Yeah. How, how then did it become a thing where it was about getting back to, you know, obviously coping with prosthetics, um, wheelchairs yeah. you know what, what what did that look like um well i mean you know you you are completely thrown into this world of you never ever thought in your worst nightmares that you would you would be in um so the first few months was just me being very ill in um in rural london and you mm. know not even being able to sit up in bed you know i remember that's to do with me losing half my body as well you just don't realize that you know um but yeah they, they basically had to had to build me back up again and I, I managed to get two super bugs while I was in there um but then I went on to uh, left Royal London um 
again, I'm. Uh, it's again another thing, another reason why maybe I was involved that day is actually I was born in in Bart's London. I'm a, as I mentioned, I'm a Bobel Cockney. Yeah, and that's where I was born in Bart's, and then I nearly died at Royal London, and they're part of the same hospital. So I'm now mm. an ambassador for that for that hospital. I just think it's, but um. Yes, I I went off to the Queen Mary's at Roehampton. Uh, absolutely brilliant hospital for learning to walk. The experience there is is amazing. The staff. Um, and what did it look like? It was it was we were in this ward, um, sort of like a prefab building ward, um, and we were like a little family. They were, we were like a little family of misfits. We all had our own room. There was about twenty patients. Um, it was like a little cottage hospital. We had relationships like brothers and sisters, and someone else was a mum, someone else was dad, and um, you know it was a brilliant environment to be in. It was a brilliant environment not to go home. I couldn't handle the thought of going to hospital every day and going home. I had to again, again the way that my mum worked. I, I had to concentrate on walking, and I had to do that. I had to do that every day. If I stayed at home, I couldn't do that. I had so to. It needed to be a residential thing, yes, like, yes. as in you were fully committed to it. Yeah, because I could have, I could have gone as an outpatient every day, but I know that psychologically that would not have worked for me. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So uh, walking school, we used to call it walking school. So we'd go down to walking school, and I um, was very lucky that I acquired many friends over that over that period. Um, but there's one friend that, and it's girl Jeanette. And she actually was in Royal London with me as well. And she's now on the volleyball team. And she lost both her legs, but also both her arms through meningitis. Right. She said she's on the volleyball team. She is on the volleyball team. She can knit. She can, she can uh, you know, sail boats. She does this. But she's, um, it was amazing having that relationship with someone that was going through something similar to me at the time. And... You know, I think we all get strength and inspiration from other people. And she truly still is my strength and inspiration because I just think if you can do it, I can do it. And I yeah. think the power of that is, is well, you can't put money on that. That is, that is you know. Um, so, yeah, so we, you, we used to go down to the walking school in the morning um, around nine o'clock. Uh, basically yeah walk all day whether that was um i had uh, things called rockers first of all that are really archaic and they that they just learn they just teach you to stand up with basically and things like that and then i was the first person that went from normal prosthetic legs to or hydraulic prosthetic legs to sea legs i've got i've got sea legs um and you probably know all about them i don't uh, to be honest i don't know even though i've got friends that are you know you know, that use them and need yeah. them. I don't actually know too much about it. I mean, to me, sea legs means I'm pretty good on a boat. That's, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I said. I said, wow, am I going to start walking across water? <laughs> what do you mean? Performing miracles. It's mm. like, whoa. And they were like, no, C stands for computerised. Oh, I ah, see. See, I've yeah. learned something there. there. There we go, yeah. Um, and they're computerised because they have a microchip in the knee. And in order to bend the knee, I need to put 70% or more of my body weight through my toes, my prosthetic toes, and a message is sent up to the microchip in the knee, and it says, allow Martine to bend, bend her, her leg. It doesn't bend for you. but um, So, yeah. Um, so, I'm very, very, again, all the support from the NHS, very, very um, lucky to, to have them. And... Yeah, and it was it was it was a tough time. Yeah, I spent three hundred sixty-six days in hospital. I used to come home uh, for half that time at weekends, um, mm. where I was at my mum's, living at my mum's. Um, and Nick, my husband, he well, wasn't my husband at the time, but my boyfriend used to used to um, stay with me. And it was I, I I remember those sort of Sunday nights. Remember those Sunday nights when you used to go back to school and used to go to school. And I'd feel I'd feel all like that on 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 a Sunday, but um, yeah. And then I 
I finally came out of there um, and then moved in with my mum. But then me and my husband got a place. We decided to move out of London as a result of what happened. Was that, uh, was that, why was that? Was that because obviously you're a proud East End girl? Yes. Very yeah. proud, I can tell yeah. that. But but yeah. what, what was the what was the reasoning for moving out? Was it psychological? Yes, I think so. I mean, my my husband struggled with it quite quite a bit as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, this is what people don't realise sometimes is families do struggle with it. Mm. <laughs> It's such an alien thing to happen and they have no control over anything that at least, you know, when you're in bed and the physio saying, do this, do this, Martine, I'm I'm in control. I'm doing it. Whereas your family and your friends, um, they're not, they're not in control and they're just trying to do everything they can. So it's a really tough time. So yes, we, we, we've got a family in Hertfordshire and Buckinghamshire, um, so um we moved out yeah near then and now um yeah we we live here although that's what was so amazing for me about the Paralympics because it was horrible I'm a proud Londoner Mm. and I didn't really want to leave London but I did I know I know it was the right time and and I know it was the right move but there's there was always something that was missing there was always something that you know, I am a romantic Londoner. I love London. Um, you know, my family are all Bow Bell Cockneys, you know. My mum and dad survived the Blitz. They were only five and six and stuff, but they were in the Blitz. They were, yeah. you know. It's, it's part of our blood. Um, so, yeah, that, ten, well, ten years ago, we moved out of London and then moved to Hertfordshire. But, to be able to go back to London when I was lucky enough to dis- discover sitting volleyball, and that was through me um, trying to go back to work. I did try and go back to work, and I sat behind the same desk that I sat behind. Yeah. And I do make a joke, because funny enough, you know, the coffee machine used to be miles away, and the photocopier used to be miles away, whereas they were, they were there then. I'd, I had my desk, and I'd like, coffee. <laughs> Brilliant, what was that? Um, and yeah, it probably took me about 90 seconds to sit at that desk and just start crying, floods of tears. Mm. Down, and I just thought, I can't, I can't do it. I don't think I'm strong enough to do it. I don't think I was strong enough to go back to my old life. Where were, do- you, where, where were you, whereabouts in London were you working? Uh, t- um, Tower Hill, so St Catherine's Dock. Yeah, I know, I know it well. Right. Our heel that morning, yeah, um, beautiful, you know. Um, but it was just looking at myself, and I and I, I had friends from that day that did go back and did their old job, and I just think you must be so strong to do that because I felt like I wasn't strong enough to go back and do the same thing I did before. I knew I had to do something different because it was so big. And it could have been seen as so negative that I knew I had to do something else with my life. So the realisation, I went to see my boss and my boss said, yes, of course, I know you were going to do that. Go off and do whatever. And that's when, you know, a few weeks later, I turned around to my mum and dad and said, I'm going to South Africa to go and get my PPL, my private part license. Well, what, what did they think of that? <laughs> I picked my mum off of the floor. She was like that. I was like, yeah, I'll give you a ride. Because obviously... They wrapped me up in cotton wool, wouldn't they? For the last yeah, of course. Year. I went, bye. And then I remember that day, and again, the irony, we turned up to Heathrow and there was a bomb scare. So I was like this, bye, mum and dad. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that was when, yeah, I started um, doing, doing different things. And then that's when I realised I missed the ambition that I used to feel at work. And as I said, I went back and I said, what, what, what could I do? And I was invited to a Paralympic potential day where you could go and try all different sports. And I tried sitting in volleyball. Um, and it's really quite a liberating sport. Anyone quite reliant on a wheelchair or in or, or prosthetic legs, you know, it, you, people don't, don't realise, but in, in sitting volleyball, we don't actually play in a wheelchair. We play on the floor. So we move constantly around on the floor. 
And it is a bit of a joke because it was first called Bumble. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Quite an unfortunate name. Uh, Yeah, I was going to say unfortunate, but anyway. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. But they changed it. But it's, 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 and I just count myself so lucky that I have experienced, met the people and really sport healed me again. Sport healed me. Sport Mm. came to my life. And um, I do believe that you don't actually have to be sporting to be involved in sport in, in society, but just that togetherness, just that understanding of other people and just belonging to something and being able to say, you know, I could I could maybe go back to London and I could maybe be an athlete at 22, mm. you know, and then it was that meaning of, well, imagine if I did that. And, um, you know, people say to me, what was your... And it wasn't an easy journey, like many people. Life isn't easy, is it? It wasn't an easy journey, especially with with a one-year-old baby. Um, you know, <laughs> there were really tough times. There were really tough times. You know, I used to leave this house sometimes just crying with the guilt of leaving, you know, my husband and my new baby and, you know, and just having that commitment. But people say to me, what is your best memory from the Paralympics? And I say... Well, there's one which was the opening ceremony, but really it was the first game that we had, and that was at the Excel Arena. And yeah. I remember the emotions. The, the, the biggest crowd we'd ever played to at that point was about 400 people at the Europeans. We were now coming out of the tunnel in front of about 5,000 people. And I remember the mix of emotions. I just remember being so excited, nervous, obviously, um, so excited to represent my country. And, and, and I came out. And I looked around and the amount of banners, you know, with names on, whether it was my name or whatever, but I looked over and I saw my family or what I call my team me. Mm -hmm. We all have a team me, but the most important is that we're part of many, many people's team me's in life. Yeah. And that's that support. That's that love that you give people. And I looked up and there were so many you know, my friends, so many people in that crowd. But I looked up to my family, my mum crying, my dad with the biggest banner in the world, you know. And, you know, it was a, we were right. Mm. We've, done, we've done well. We've, we've done well. We've, the last seven years has been tough. But look at what, <laughs> look, we're back. We are back in London doing something so amazing you know so it was like a full circle for me and it was really important to go back to London share that memory with my family say thank you but really to really realize that that we might have been through tough things but life is is pretty pretty good but it was but when you think about I mean it's an amazing story it's, I mean, it's a sad, you know, there's, there's bits of the story which are, which are hard. But when you think about it, like, it is unbelievable. It's, you know, on the 6th of July, London gets told um, that, you know, we've been on the, the Olympics, which was, which was massive news. You know, you've already alluded to that. And then the 7th of July, your life changes in a way that you probably never imagined. And then the thing that got awarded to London on the 6th of July, you're taking part in. Seven, seven years later, that's that is and bonkers. It. Yeah, and now, Foxy, my lucky number is seven. Now, again, people makes think sense. I'm off my rock again. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. I get it. Yeah, I imagine you do. Um, but people do say, Why? Why would mm. you ever wrong? Number seven is your lucky number, and it's that facing your demons. It's 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 actually, if I could just take power from it, something positive from it, yeah. Then Good, and I do. And actually, talking about power, I have a a mindset now that I I follow. I imagine you you've got a few mindsets as well. Um, <laughs> but I, it's just basically um, just coping mechanisms that deal with life. And I I call it my my power of seven. And it's it is things like you know something happens and we've got choices. And it's about change and we're all scared of change but we've got to embrace that's about marginal gain but that's not about the sports world or the corporate world it's about this it's Mm. about 
ups and downs of, of dealing with things. Um, it's got team me in, you know, obviously, again, that's really important. This, I would not be here talking to you if it wasn't for the support that I have and have had from many thousands of people. Yeah. But what it is as well is in life, you know, it's, it's of course, it's about the support and it's about realising what you've got and appreciating what you've got, but it's about belief. It's about <laughs> believing that you can do anything you want to do. If you believe, you can do anything you want to do. And it's about that belief that, you know, for instance, at the moment, you know, things are getting better. Unfortunately, we can't control. We have a certain amount of control over it, but certain things we can't. And, and it's just that belief and that togetherness that we're going to get through it. And, um, yes, you say that it is weird. I mean, it is, isn't it? You can't get away. From the fact that the whole reason why I was late that morning was I'd been celebrating and thinking about, I've got to get tickets to this. This is going to be massive. I've got to get tickets. And I didn't. You didn't and, need uh, tickets in the end. <laughs> <laughs> we the family don't get free tickets. Well, we did. It, but, people, get, people wanting tickets to come and see you, let alone you getting tickets. You're already in. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, um, you know, that's why I can't get away from the fact that, um, and not everyone would agree, you know, that there, there, there might be two schools of thought to, to, to your listeners today. And, 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 you know, that is, maybe half of us believe there's a fate, yeah? Maybe half of us believe that things happen because, you know, there's a path, there's a destined path. Maybe some people don't believe that. Maybe some people just happen because it, it, it happens. And we can never know that. But what, what, what I truly believe is we might not ever know what's going to happen to us until it happens to us. We might not know our journey until it happens to us. Mm. And it's not the journey. It's not what happens to us that's important. It's what we do with what happens. To us. So things will happen in life. Look, look at what's happening at the moment and how we're all coping with it. Um, you know, and that's what the most important thing is. It's not what happens. It's how we all cope with it. Exactly. And how we deal with it together. Exactly. It's about yeah. So roll, rolling with the punches and being a little bit flexible with what what you need to do to survive, really, isn't it? Exactly. Adaptable. It's about it's about adapting to it, and um, you know, and it's about looking at it in a certain certain way. Anything, anything in life, you've got a negative and a positive. But especially at the moment, I think, you know, the positives out there are huge. It, it, examples every single day, whether you turn on the news or whether, you know, I'm speaking to you or reading something on social media or even through friends and family, people going out there and saying, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not taking this. I'm not taking this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at change in a positive way. I'm going to get something from it. And whether yeah. it's raising millions for the NHS or whether it's, you know, again, us out clapping on a Thursday or, or showing that appreciation. It's all those things to say, I'm not going to take this change line down. I'm not going to be scared of it. I'm going to embrace it and get something from it. Exactly. I totally agree with you. I mean, it's great to hear you say that. And I knew you'd say that anyway, because where you are and what you've been through. But um, moving on a little bit, Obviously, yeah. because of because of everything that we've spoken that you've spoken about and the Olympics and whatever, you're now a motivational speaker as well, which is great. Oh, I, I like um, the way you, you sound like a Bo Bell cock me a bit. Motivational. I don't know. I, you know what? I'm a I'm a bit of a mix of all sorts. I think I live in London now, bit, so maybe maybe yeah. I've caught maybe I've caught it. Maybe yeah. I've, I've spent a bit of time in Shoreditch, which isn't too far from from <laughs> from your neck of the woods. So. Yeah, that's where my mum and dad grew up. And Shoreditch was so different compared oh, back, to... Is it, this is back when it was not trendy. Oh, really? All oh, right. No, no, I mean, when, when, when your mum and... Where they, when they grew up there, no doubt it wasn't... Uh, it is a, no, no, a far, no. far cry from what it's like now. Exactly. They're, they're from that area, and they decided they went, this area, the East London, North Angel, all that, never going to get anywhere. Never going to get... They, they grew up on the most expensive 
you know, uh, roads in, in London now, and they decided to move out to the suburbs to Edgware to zone five. And um, yeah. And who, yeah. Who'd have, who'd have thought? But uh, what, so being a motivational speaker, what, yeah. um, what motivates you? I know what you're going to say, but what motivates you day to day? What is your motivation? Um, my motivation is being able to enjoy what I do. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I really love talking. <laughs> I reckon you quite like talking as well, Bobsy. Um, I, quite, I quite like listening. I've, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a funny feeling that you like to talk in. Anyway, go on. <laughs> well, I went back a few years ago. I went back to my old school and uh, just did a talk. And a couple of the teachers were there, retired now, that, that taught me. And they went, "Oh, Martin, it's so good, to, you know, see you." And I was like, "Yeah." yeah. And they were really enjoyed that talk. And I went, yeah. "Do you remember when you used to call me Mighty Mouth?" And you used to say I talk too much. And they were like, yeah. And they were like, look at me now. I made, I made a career out of it. Um, but, no, I love, I mean, I, do, I know, again, I know it sounds cheesy, but, you know, that was a big, big day. That was a big, big day and a big experience to go through. And, you know, again, we turn the news on in the morning, don't we? And we can see that terrorism is part of our, our everyday lives. And I just see, for me to get through that, whether that was me, whether that was my family, whether it was all those power of seven that I talk about, um, you know, it's a it's an experience that I feel like I need to share. Is it is that maybe if there's one, I mean, the amazing people I meet when I when I go out, and I'm not talking about famous people, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about normal people dealing with normal things. Um, and, you know, there's people that put up their hands in front of 300 people and ask me a question, or there's people that approach me after in tears saying what they're going through at the moment. And to be able to be... It's such an honour to be taken into their world and they're sharing the deepest thoughts. But I just think if I can help one of those people, one of those people, um, you know, then all the pain that I've been through has, has, has been worth it. So to be able to meet people and go out and, and meet other inspirational people, as I said, people dealing with normal normal life is really important to, as I said, to do what I enjoy doing. Spending time with family, uh, mm. you know, to, keeping fit, you know, being part of the team, being part of a dream, a dream that I never, ever thought could ever exist 15 years ago. Um, yeah. And, you know, just, you know, I think this is what the last four months has done for all of us, hopefully, is that. We've all appreciate. We're all appreciating what we've got. What you said at the beginning of the interview. You know, we are really all appreciating what we've got. But yeah, yeah. I just want to keep pushing myself because that's what I enjoy doing. <clears throat> and I'm not talking absolutely huge things. It can just be small things. Um, so spending time with family, friends, you know, all that. Um, just appreciating what we've got and and and, and, and appreciating your team me around you because yeah, really yeah. appreciate that because <clears throat> I'm now in hospital and I'm a mentor for, for, for patients and things and sometimes they don't have that team me and, and again I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, maybe like your colleagues in the past and things like that they might not have they might be through really tough times and not actually have that team me and they're the inspirations to me they're you know they're so strong those people in order to get through if I can sit down and have a cup of tea with them and talk about or answer a few questions that they might not be comfortable talking about someone else or just having a bit of a laugh about the stuff, you know. Mm. Um, that, that makes my day feel feel more fulfilled. Well, I mean, what you do is amazing. And I think it's really important that you do go out there and speak to those people because you are a, an inspiration to a lot of people out there. And, yeah, I mean, that's... A, a great thing and I think it's important that you're doing that and it's really needed as well um 
whilst we're on that subject, what sort of advice could you give to someone that's experienced trauma? What, what, I mean, it's, I know, I'm, I'm very aware that it's all very individual, isn't it? I mean, you know, I talk about mental health and, and dealing with trauma, but the one thing I do try to say is it's, it's bespoke to that person. But even with that in mind, what sort of, you know, is there any sort of advice that you'd give to someone that's listening? who maybe has experienced trauma and is still in the sort of... In this, yeah. You know, in uh, that pit. I think, yeah. Um, you know, we do, we all we all experience trauma in, in different ways, and that's what is the most difficult thing, thing about it. You know, you might have the same injury, but you have two people that deal with it in, in a different way. Um, and what I found has... Well, in the beginning, what I found was going off and doing things that I never ever thought I could do. So doing something as a result of that trauma, doing something different, Mm. uh, that really helped me. Um, But actually just dealing with those ups and downs, realizing that your team me is really important and they're the guys that are gonna get you you through it. Um, But just realizing that it's normal to feel up and down. Everyone deals with it in a different way. Do not look at, well, you might, you might look at another patient in the hospital, like I did, like I did. And I sat there and I, I looked at other patients that I was in hospital with, that I was, that, that were involved that day. And I, I looked at them and I'm like, right, well, you, you've lost one leg. You've lost one foot. Oh, you've lost one arm. I've nearly lost one arm and I've lost both my legs above the knee. Uh, uh, in the beginning, it was like, why? Why is this happened? Why have I? Why have I got this? Um, and uh, you know, I just think that people deal with things in in in, in different ways. And I think that you know, um, I knew I had to go ahead. And in order to get over my my acquired disability, I knew I had to do something. As I said, as a result of what happened. So whether it was flying a plane. And, or whether it was, you know, I don't know, jumping out of plane or whatever. But it was all those things that I would have never dreamt in my normal life before that I would have done. And it was about achieving something that, I mean, usually when I talk to a, a normal person, Foxy, I might go, well, you, have you ever jumped out of a plane? And they'll go, no. You know, oh, have you ever flown a plane? And they'll go, no. And obviously you'll go, yes, yes. But, <laughs> I haven't um, flown. You know, it, it, it's that thing of I might not be able to run for that bus anymore. I might not be able, you know, in the beginning, I remember being obsessed by people on their phones just walking up the road. No care in the world. I can't do that. You know, I, I, I look at cracks in the pavement when I'm walking and this and that. And, that. And, and it was about doing something that I thought, I never, ever could do this in my old life. And also, you might be able to run for a bus, but do you know what I can do? I can fly a plane. So it was, it, it, it's, about, it's about that. But really, it's about also dealing with the ups and downs. Realising like- that, yeah, that, that, that you have those days when you feel like you can't take any more, when you feel like you don't want to go outside, when, when, when you know, you just want to hide under your duvet. And then the next day, you might still feel exactly the same as that. But you have to realise that you have to go through those in order to heal yourself. And you have to realise that all those small, small increments add up to bigger, bigger ones. So, you know, especially for our mental well-being, when you feel like you're not getting anywhere, when you feel like, why? Why? Why me? Why me? That's a hard question to get over. Why me? Um, I, I suppose but, my take from what you're saying there is that essentially is about get, having people use their experience with that trauma as a motivator to get to get through it and move on. You know, move, you know, you know. Yes, things have happened, but instead of like dwelling on it too much, now, always, you know, we're humans. We like to we like to. Yeah feel a bit down every now and again and we like to dwell on things but not 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 too much and always to use that as the driving force to push you forward I think that's that's my impression I get from the way that you dealt with it yeah yeah the way I dealt with it 
it's yeah pretty pretty much take take strength from it but don't give yourself a hard time try and talk about it with your team you've got to keep talking and whether sitting in front of someone and not really talking to them and just seeing them and having a cup of tea and things like that you know um but just realizing that you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days and all those days you need to experience in order to get over the trauma that you've got over. But actually, as you said, internalise that. You, you know, use the strength. Use that trauma in order to achieve any the possibilities. are massive. The possibilities are massive. And, yeah, I might not be able to run for that bus anymore, but, you know, I'm off to a competition in a few months' time in Slovenia, you know. Um, it's, it's funny the way the world works, isn't it? And, you know, I think we can all say that as well with the pandemic that we've been we've been experiencing at, at the moment. But hopefully what I think all this has taught us is appreciating what we have mm-hmm. and appreciating what we can do together as well. Um, again, you, you know, we've, we've all heard about the two metre, one metre social distancing rule. In um, well, it's one meter at the moment, but in in volleyball, we actually have a one meter rule on on um, on court. And there's six of us on court, and we're all responsible for a one meter around us. But what we don't do is we don't say it's one meter apart. We say it's one meter together because we have to cover that space. That is not dead space. Um, and I think you know we can take lessons from that really. Oh, yeah, it's funny that because me, a friend of mine, we always talk about, you know, when when all else is going mental around you, chaos ensues and just concentrate on that one metre square around you. That's all that matters. So I, I like the way that it ties in with your uh, sit-down volleyball. Excellent. Sitting, sitting volleyball. Sitting, 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 sorry. Lots of people say sit-down volleyball. I'm sorry, sorry, sitting, no, that- corrected. Um with all that in mind, I want to I want to quickly move on to something that I think is really important, and it's it's about your com- your campaigning for basically the rights for disabled people or, or victims of trauma. Can can you let us know what what you've got going on there? Because I think it's a very important thing that we should start to sort of talk about. Yeah. Um, so I've I've recently, and I want to get more involved again. As I said, I you know, was on that tube on the 7th of July. And I think, you know, the lessons that I've learned and what I've had to deal with and my team, me, you know, I feel like I've got a duty to to help other people, to, to, to you know, pass on, to talk about it. To, to, to. So um, I do help victims of trauma and whether that is from um, being a mentor for patients that have recently either been through trauma or, or, or lost limbs, mm. um, I, I, I go and do that at, at, at Queen Mary's. And then um, at Royal London, as I said, I'm an ambassador. So they've just had a huge campaign on trauma, realising that trauma is, you know, it's cutting edge. You, you know, trauma, we live more in a traumatic society now, don't we? It's like things oh, happen all the time. Mm. So investment in trauma is really important. So um, I've just been helping them out with that. And uh, Professor Green did that as well. He's a very interesting man. Um, I, I know him, yeah. Yeah. So he was he part of that because obviously what he's been through. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, yeah, and I'm, I definitely I, I want to definitely get more involved with um, families, families of... Um, Families of trauma, but families of terrorism. Um, and, you know, over the last year or so, um, I've been working with, with with some victims and some families. You know, I remember 15 years ago, you know, going to certain memorial services and meeting families of loved ones that they, they, they'd lost that day. Mm. And, again, if I can help someone like that going through the hell that you go through, then again, all the pain has 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 been worth it. You know that's so rewarding just seeing someone going either. Oh, you know, you've just said something that I know that you completely understand what I'm going through. Or 
you know, you just said something that I never thought of it in that way. And, and you know, to be able to do that. And obviously campaigning, yeah, disability um, rights. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I get frustrated. I, I, I go out in London a lot and access wise is, is um, you know, absolutely awful. I was campaigning about the, um, the different assessments. I mean, that's been ridiculous, different assessments that the government's been doing. But yeah, I try and I try and do my bit, but I think I've got a fantastic job that if I can go out every day and speak to people um, and give them some sort of strength and hope, then that's a good job, isn't it? That's it's, a good, it's I like awesome. It. I think it, it, it's a necessary job that especially, yeah. I think it's really important if you're someone that's been through something to support people that are going through similar things because it really they they only want a lot of the time they only want someone that understands to yeah. be able to speak to yeah. but go, go, going back to the disability thing it is shocking actually because obviously over the past few years i've got friends that have uh, that are disabled I, and I've, yeah. you know i've met other people there's a there's a girl called sophie who's um been on tv a few times she's wheelchair bound and oh, i know sophie yeah, and because of that, I, 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 yeah, that's right. So, if, and I, 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 I sort of, as I travel, yeah, yeah, as I, as I travel around London, I sort of take note of, you know, how accessible some places are, and it's, it's pretty shocking, isn't it? You know, I mean, you know, obviously London is one of the older cities, you know, out there, but it is shocking still that, you know. We, we, we're all, we should all be equals in our society and we're living in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah? exactly. And, and I still can't get into certain certain places because, um, you know, whether it's I'm in my wheelchair or whether it's on my legs and, I, I you know, there's that access-wise is, 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 um, is rubbish. So I think all of us, all of us need to... I mean, there's places, don't get me wrong, there's places that are doing amazing stuff. I went to a hotel the other day um it's Rus well it's actually in Russell Square. Um, mm. And um it's the Russell Square Hotel and uh I went there to do a presentation um and they've got this staircase that that literally goes I, I filmed it because we're going by Twitter account be able to and it goes into this lift this marble staircase just disappears and go and I had to film it. I mean I, I you know I just got so excited that I had to film this technology yeah. that is available in the 21st century, that why aren't there some government funding, you know, government rally so are throwing money here, there and everywhere at the moment. But this has been going on for years. It's like, just mm. sort it out. But yeah, Sophie does loads. Sophie does yeah. good. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done, isn't there? It's yeah. fair to say. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, Martin. So yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to ask. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you one more question from me, right? For our conversation. Yeah. What I'm going to do is you're answering that. I'm going to flick through some questions that uh, people have thrown in at us on Instagram. And what happens there All is right. the question I read out. They win a bottle of Talisker. Nice. They get you to answer their question. So, nice. so before before we do that. Yeah. Who's been the most inspirational person that you've ever met, or not even met? Actually, who who who's that person that you've taken strength from, and and has driven you in a in the right direction to be the person yeah. you are today? Um. So people ask me that question, they they're always expecting someone, mm. someone famous or some sports person, and it's not what what inspires me is normal people just normal people and for instance not normal people because they're not normal so for instance my mum my mum and dad they on what they have been through and managed to you know just keep us all together with the pain that we all went through and the strength that they they they've shown as i mentioned you know maggie my physio she is my inspiration Jeanette, one of my best friends that lost both her legs and arms you know recently as i said there's been so many examples of um inspir i mean you know there's been quite a few times where i'm trying to turn the bbc news off because i've been in floods of tears that that little boy is it tony 
Tony, who literally has just got his prosthetic legs. Yeah, yeah. Some injuries he's sustained through his parents or his father not being very nice to him. And um, mm. he's just done 10K, hasn't he? And raised over a million. Yeah, so, so it's awesome. I mean, and these are just normal people living, living normal lives. And I suppose that's what gives me that inspiration. There's not one person, there's not one big person, there's not, not you know, a one big sport star. It's actually normal people living with things in their lives, living with ups and downs and dealing with it and being able to laugh through it and being able to get something positive from it. There's, there's basically inspiration in your own street, isn't there, really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And haven't we all seen it? Mm. This is what I mean. Through all this last few months, we've seen it. We've seen people communicating more. We've seen us doing more things for our neighbours. We've seen, you know, people looking at the world in a different way. They've, yeah. they've been forced to do that, obviously. We've we've all been in, and like you said at the beginning of the interview, is to say, let's hope that it doesn't immediately revert back to that. Mm. Let's, we have learned lessons from this. And that we so. can move forward in order to, you know, make this world a better place that we live in. Yeah, I hope so. I mm. hope that does happen. Mm. But that actually fits in well with the question I've asked, that I'm going to ask that I didn't ask actually. I picked it out. Mm. So this is this is the Talisker winner. Well done. Uh, it's 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 on Instagram. Uh, it's on Instagram. The person is Mish C. 90 so it's m-i-c-h-c nine nine zero right <clears throat> she's written firstly congratulations on all you've achieved you're a true inspiration my question is at what point do you do you believe your determination and resilience was born as a result of surviving such a horrific experience or were those traits of yours prior to the accident that you hadn't necessarily needed to harness i thought it's quite an interesting Good question. you know yeah Interesting. Um, I think that, um, well, again, I didn't really think about it, but I have obviously thought about it over over, over the past few several years. And uh, mm. uh, it's only the people that have told me, people my team, me, people that know me really well, that said, Martin, you've always been a half glass full than a half glass empty girl. Yeah. Um, and that's not just me down the pub, obviously, but, but you know, <laughs> and... and and I can I can see that and, and, and a very early so I think that's really helped me. I think that has really helped me. So in answer to that, I think I had some something inside me, first of all. Um and I I I remember very early on in hospital when I literally just came out of a coma and my my brother, my older brother Grant, um, he came to me really in tears. And I've got an older brother and an older sister. And I said, what, what are you crying for? And he said, I just feel really guilty. I've thought of something and I feel really guilty. And I said, what, what is it? And he said, I just think out of all three of us, Martine, you're the only one that could deal with this. You're the only one that's got the strength out of three of us to deal with this. And I remember that so early on mm. and what it gave me. And again, that might not be my internal strength. That might be the strength that you get you know, he, he was saying to me, you have got that strength. I know that you don't feel like you've got that strength at the moment, but, you know, you, you have got that strength. So I suppose I feel like I did have that strength. I feel like I've relied on it a lot more. Um, I've found strength from other people. I think that's what you do as well when you have those awful days where you think, I can't take any more, or, or you know, you have to have... You have to start conversing with people. You have to have a coping mechanism in order, in order to 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 get through that. Um, but yeah, I think I've always been a half glass girl and a half glass empty, and that has definitely helped me. But yeah. taken away from the love and support, whether it's from your family or NHS professionals, you know, that's what's got me through that strength. That's a great answer, and. Um... I like that you brought your brother's comment in there because um, yeah. that's it's like really a, I think I think that's nice that he could be honest about his own feelings. You know, he says he felt guilty about it, but yeah. I think I think that's a good 
I think that's strength on his part, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. the way your your team me or your family saw you as an individual but I can tell you know having you know we're gonna to have to wind it up but yeah you know having spoken to you I can tell that your, your character is definitely something that has got you through this and and it's not something you've developed over the last 15 years it's something that's developed from the beginning so yeah I mean it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you Martine and I feel really humbled to be able to speak to you and you know um, I'd like to wish you luck with everything you've got going yeah. on, and you. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll be at, we'll get to meet one day in person when 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 everyone's allowed to do that sort of thing. That'd be lovely. That'd be mm. lovely. I'd, I'd I'd love to have a go with your program. <laughs> well, have, yeah, let's 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 <laughs> work that one. Let's let's let's, let's work let's work it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's lovely to speak to you. Yeah, I and mean, hopefully. It, we can actually meet each other in the future. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Martin, thanks so much. That was awesome. It was great to just listen to your story. Thanks very much to Martin for such an inspiring story. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and follow me and the Book of Man for the latest news. Thanks again to Talisker for supporting this podcast and thanks to you all for listening. See you again soon. <laughs>